Christine Schneider, the visceral voice. Welcome to the Visceral Voice Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Schneider. Every two weeks on this podcast, I talk with voice specialists, manual therapists, health specialists, psychotherapists, movement practitioners, and professional voice users about voice science, function, medication, movement, puberty and aging, and everything in between. I am on a quest not only to become a better manual therapist, but also to learn everything I can about the living, breathing body and its intricate connection to the voice. This podcast documents the continuation of my learning and my experience as a professional singer, a nutritional consultant, and a manual therapist. Join me every two weeks as we strive to provide current, knowledgeable, creative, and compassionate information to help restore, regain, and create happiness and success in your vocal journey. Hello, everyone. If you haven't already filled out the questionnaire, please do so. This really gives me ideas of what direction to take the podcast in, and I really appreciate your ideas. So thank you for filling out the questionnaire for those who have, and thank you for those who are going to. If you enjoy this podcast and you would like to become a supporter for a donation of $5 a month, you not only get my complete gratitude, but you also get to send in your questions for my guests. You can find a link for Patreon in my show notes. Thank you so much for considering becoming a supporter of the Visceral Voice podcast. I am very grateful for your consideration. I hope that you continue to enjoy the episodes. Please give me your feedback, and I look forward to hearing from you. Amanda Flynn moved to New York City from Tyler, Texas to pursue her career in musical theater. Although her performing career continues, she was inspired to begin a new journey into teaching. She completed a Master of Music in Vocal Performance with a music theater concentration, as well as an advanced certificate in vocal pedagogy, both from NYU. She also completed her Certificate of Vocology from the University of Utah and was honored with the Janet Pransky Professional Development Scholarship presented by the New York Singing Teachers Association, where she completed the Distinguished Voice Professional Program. She was honored with the prestigious Van Lawrence Fellowship in 2019 presented by the Voice Foundation and Nats. In addition, she completed the Mount Sinai Vocology Mentorship at the Eugene Grabscheid Voice Center, as well as an observership at the Sean Parker Institute for voice in the NYU Voice Center. She has completed level one and level two of biodynamic manual voice therapy, as well as foundations of myofascial release for neck, voice, and swallowing disorders. She is a proud member of AEA, NATS, NYSTA, PAVA, VASTA, MTEA, and the Voice Foundation. Here you are. I am thrilled to bring you my conversation with Amanda Flynn. Hi, Amanda. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Christine. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Long overdue. (laughs) Yes, I know. So to the listeners, uh, Amanda was going to be part of the conversation with Jared Trudeau in the first season on belting through some of their research, which we will talk to today. But she was what perfectly wonderfully working on a show at the time and was called in to coach she so she was unable to make that interview so we set up this interview to talk today about research so thank you for taking the time again for being here i'm thrilled that you were able to get to work with those performers in the show and i'm sure that the producers of the show and the actors of the show are really happy to have you there too so life happens yeah, you know it's been a crazy year that's all i'll say about that is that it's been a crazy very um wonderful but crazy year so i appreciate you being so patient with me and i am thrilled to be here today yay so amanda You are not only an incredible performer, but you are also one of the most sought after voice teachers in New York City. Can you talk to us about your journey into becoming a voice teacher? Sure. You know, I think like many of my colleagues, well, maybe not everybody, but like a lot of people, you know, I moved to New York to perform and um, did that for a while, did a tour and some Broadway sit downs of different shows and, you know, worked for, for quite a bit and was really, you know, happy with my performing career. Um, and then I was, uh, I was working on um, a show, um, a Broadway sit down, and I started having some trouble with my voice. 
case. It was a little mysterious at the time and, you know, kind of hard to uh, figure out what was going on. But, you know, I was really, really frustrated that I was having issues with my voice and I was met with no help at all, really. You know, there was no help from my show. There was no help from my union. Um, and I felt really stuck and nobody really was able, no doctor at the time was able to really give me a clear answer as to what was going on. And everyone just kind of kept pointing fingers and going, well, it's just your technique. You don't really know what you're doing. And, you know, I never claimed to be perfect, but I really felt like that was not really the answer to what was going on. Um, so I was really, really frustrated. So I, um, once I finished my run in the show and I came back to New York, Work. I got synced up with a great voice team that was able to help me. You know, I was having ultimately what the problem was, was I was on medications because I have asthma. So I was on medications that were causing some side effects, some vocal side effects. And once all that got situated, my voice came back and was great. And, and through that whole process, I thought, wow, this was so simple. And, and mm. I was met with so much resistance and so much sort of blame and finger pointing. And I thought, this is terrible. <laughs> and so mm. I, I, you know, at that point was like, I think I really want to learn more about this because I became really fascinated, first of all, in just the voice in general, as I kind of went through my process of figuring my stuff out. Uh, I became really interested in, in the voice and in, you know, how it works and how we sustain it. And I also became really passionate about helping people that were in situations I was in. So helping people that had had some sort of injury or even not an injury, but just an issue of some sort, helping people in shows those types of things became really, I became really passionate about them. So, you know, I was at a time in my performing career where I was sort of entering into kind of my late twenties, almost 30. And, you know, work kind of started to slow down for me. I kind of fell into this void of people not really knowing what to do with me as a performer and uh, me also not really knowing where I fit. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to grad school. I'm going to just kind of put a pause on performing. I'm going to go to graduate school and study, study this a little bit. And I did, and I kind of never looked back. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I got out of grad school and I just started teaching and it just took off. And I thought, oh, this is the thing I'm meant to do. You know, performing was great and I love it. And I still love performing. You know, I, every once in a while I get up on stage and sing something. But, you know, I thought this is really, really what it's about for me. You know, the performing stuff was to prepare me for this. And that's very mm -hmm. clear to me now. You know, what I love about teaching voice is that for me, it's a perfect blend of science and art because my little science nerdy brain loves it. But then <laughs> my passionate, you know, creative storyteller self also really loves it because it, it, for me, it's just this little like nook of our business that allows you to, to blend those two things, you know, in a way that dance does as well, that it's, you know, a very scientific thing with the body, but also, you know, it has a creative end game. So, so that's kind of how I, how I ended up here. And I, I, you know, it wasn't what I intended to do when I moved to New York and came here, but it definitely is where I ended up and definitely where I was meant to be. So. Yeah. Well, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you. <laughs> so since you became a voice teacher, you've studied in a lot of different programs, the vocology program. I know you've done some manual courses. Uh -huh. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the classes that you've done in in a form of a continuing education? Yeah, you know, so when I when I finished my uh, my grad program, I, I went to NYU where I did a master's in performance. That was really important to me because my undergrad wasn't in performing because um, I'd initially sort of dropped out of school and moved to New York and started my career. So when I knew I wanted to go to grad school, I had to finish my undergrad. And so I got um, an undergraduate degree in liberal arts, which I loved because it was great for me as an adult getting to kind of study a hodgepodge of a lot of different things. But it was really important when I went to grad school that I did get a degree in performance because I felt like that was going to be really beneficial. So at NYU, I did that, but then also did the advanced certificate in vocal pedagogy. So um, I was able to really study performance and pedagogy, which was was really, really helpful to do kind of both side by side. So I did that. And then um, when I graduated, I thought, wow, I learned so many things and know so little. So I have to keep learning. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I did a lot of things. Um, you know, I kind of, you know, jumped into sort of every learning opportunity I could find. I did 
the NYSTA, the New York Singing Teachers Association, they have a professional development program, which I highly recommend. It's online. Um, and so I did that program. Um, and I did um, a vocology mentorship at Mount Sinai. I'm not sure if they still have it, but I did that years ago. I did the Summer Vocology Institute, which is a very intense eight-week program at the University of Utah. And oh, yes, I've done, um, you were saying the, the sort of the manual stuff. I've done some, you know, some um, training in different sort of hands-on work, mostly so that when I put my hands on people's larynx <laughs> and on their body, I have a better understanding of kind of what I'm feeling and what my my goals are with like helping people stretch and feel like they're getting, you know, the most out of their body. So I've done a couple of different training, training programs there, myofascial release, and then um, something called biodynamic manual voice therapy, which is um, a program run by this woman named Michelle Fava, who's a voice therapist who uses a lot of hands-on work in her voice therapy work and sort of teaches other people her approach. And it's very gentle and very much just about kind of calming the nervous system, which is really great (laughs) for performers. So, you know, I'm, I'm a constant learner. And so I'm always, you know, looking for ways to learn new things. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something (laughs) that I've done, but, you know, you know, particularly right out of grad school, those first three or four years, I really just dove into any, any opportunity that existed that was potentially going to teach me something. It was just so, so important to me that I could learn everything I could learn. And it's still very important to me. So, yeah. I know. All of my favorite people are the same as me, where we just, what we constantly need is just to keep learning. So. Keep learning. You know, it, it's it's funny. I had a conversation with a voice teacher friend recently, and we talked about that, like, moment right out of grad school when you're like, I have a master's degree. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and then you kind of get a little bit out of it. and You go, oh, wait, I know nothing. I know nothing. And you have to just keep learning. So, <laughs> Yeah. So, Amanda, in the last several years, you have become heavily interested in research. Can we discuss your research now? Let's first talk about your research with vocal health education in undergraduate performing arts training programs. Um, sure. So, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I have done a lot of research, and that was not something that I necessarily felt particularly qualified to do. You know, I definitely did not go to a, a heavy research program. I, I mean, at the Vocology Institute, we did do, you know, some study and research. So, I, I you know, I did learn some things. But, you know, it's funny. I think about researchers, and I think about, you know, people with PhDs that sit in labs all day. And I started, you know, that's definitely not what I do. I sit behind a piano all day. But, you know, I I started to realize that, you know, I I have ideas and I have questions and I, you know, have luckily surrounded myself with people that, you know, have helped teach me how to find answers to those questions and help take those ideas into a more fully finished, you know, product or, or, or paper or, you know, research project. So I definitely never intended to be such a researcher, but I guess I am. So yeah, so my my, my vocal health study is a study that I, I published in the Journal of Voice just this last year, February, March-ish, something like that. There were two big circumstances that sort of led me to this study. The first is that, you know, I work in a university program. And in that university program, I always <laughs> felt like, wow, I do such a good job at teaching vocal health, right? I'm so good at it. I'm talking about it all the time. And I'm teaching my kids so many things. And, you know, really was like patting myself on the back about it. And then I started to learn very quickly that I was actually terrible at it. And I thought I was so good at it because I knew so many things. And I would say so many things to my students. But, you know, they would still come back to me and be like, you know, oh, summer stock, I completely lost my voice the whole summer. Or, oh, I forgot about, you know, using straw phonation. Or, oh, I totally forgot that that's what I needed. You know, those are the things I needed to do when I started to feel sick. Or, oh, I totally didn't run a humidifier. You know, all these things that we bark at our students all the time. And I thought, wow, I am spending so much energy telling them this information. And, I don't know why they're not getting it. So that was sort of this first moment of, of, of kind of like a very humbling moment of realizing that I was actually the thing I was the most passionate about. I was actually not getting through to my kids about the second sort of moment was in my private studio. So I'm fortunate enough to collaborate with a lot of laryngologists and voice therapists here in the city. I do a lot of work with singers that have sustained injuries. And so in that work, something that was said to me all the time was, why wasn't I taught this in school? 
people would Mm -hmm. say to me so much, like I never even heard the name of my injury until I was diagnosed and sitting in a doctor's office. Why did no one tell me about this stuff? And so those two moments kind of made me have this realization of, we don't know what we're doing <laughs> in, in college. We we think we're doing such a good job of, of preparing our kids and preparing our, our students for these things that they're going to encounter in their life. And the reality is we're not doing a good job. So I decided I need, we need to dig a little bit about how we could best prepare our students to handle their vocal health as well as potential vocal injuries once they graduate. So I did a survey study. So I created a survey and I had students that were recent graduates. They had graduated within five years of the, the survey study time. So I wanted to kind of look at those first few years after graduation. I looked at acting majors, musical theater majors, and classical voice majors to kind of look at comparisons between different programs. I had 352 respondents, which was pretty good. Um, We got a a nice wide spread. You know, I asked a lot of questions in this survey because I wanted to look at a lot of different things. So we had pretty, pretty amazing results, honestly. Do you want me to dive into that, Christine? Like, sure, yeah. yeah. So, you know, some of the big sort of like broad strokes were that unsurprisingly, all the majors learned more about general vocal health and hygiene than they learned about vocal injury. So most people felt like, yeah, people told me to drink water, but I have no idea what a vocal fold hemorrhage is, that sort of idea. We also found that the classical voice majors learned a lot more about both topics than musical theater or acting majors. Also, not not surprising, you know, traditionally, we think of classical voices, maybe um, imparting that information a little more effectively. Something that was really interesting was that I asked if they knew of someone that had a vocal injury while in school, and 80% of musical theater majors said that someone they knew while in school had a vocal injury, wow. which is pretty high. 72% of classical voice majors said yes, and 60% of acting majors Most students said that they disclosed their injury to their teachers, but the percentage that said that they didn't, the number one reason why was fear of being chastised for poor technique. Mm -hmm. So this fear of saying, I can't tell my, the head of my program that I have a vocal injury because they're going to think I don't know how to sing or don't know how to use my voice, I should say. Again, that's not surprising. You know, that breaks my heart, but it's a not surprising um, finding. Another really interesting thing is that acting majors reported the most injuries or injury-like symptoms within the first five years after graduation. Okay. So they actually reported the least amount of injuries while in school. They also reported the least amount of vocal health information given to them in school. <laughs> and they reported, you know, a pretty high number reported not feeling comfortable with their vocal health after graduating, but they definitely reported the most injuries after graduation. You know, we can speculate that perhaps that is because they are given the least amount of vocal health information on school. Again, that's a big speculation, but I don't think it's completely off base to kind of assume that there might be some connection there. Interestingly, musical theater majors reported the fewest injuries after graduation, Mm. but the most while in school. So that, again, is another sort of interesting, weird sort of finding that we have, well, lots of injuries while in school, but not as many after school. Why? Um, Again, if you read the paper, you'll you'll see I kind of speculate about these things. But, you know, part of it is, I think, because, you know, musical theater majors, you know, the eight show a week situation, singing high demands, they tend to be warriors a bit (laughs) with their voice and, you know, under understand a bit of ebbing and flowing of the voice perhaps makes injuries um, easier to hide than if you're using your voice in a different way. Who knows? Um, That would be a great follow-up study to figure out some answers to some of these numbers. But musical theater majors, only about 54% reported knowing what to do if they thought they had an injury. So that is really interesting. 70% of classical voice majors said they knew what to do if they thought they had injured their voice, but only about 54% of musical theater majors. So that also might have something to do with why they reported fewer injuries after school. So um, so again, those are kind of some global findings about who is getting injured and how that's happening. Some of the, the more tangible information that I was actually really hoping to take away so that we can change how we teach vocal health is I saw a di- definitely a direct connection between the timing, uh, the timing of when we teach vocal health and how we teach vocal health um, relating to uh, Uh, graduates' perception. So when vocal health was only presented in voice lessons or when someone showed up sick to a rehearsal or a class, 
students that only had vocal health taught in those ways, they reported a very poor perception of their current vocal health. Students that had vocal health taught in an organized workshop, they reported a much stronger perception of their vocal health after graduation. That was a really common thing that that in some some programs, vocal health is only approached with the voice teacher one-on-one, and it's only approached when you come into a lesson sick. (laughs) You're said, go home, don't use your voice, drink a lot of water. But that is not enough in order to sort of retain a strong perception of vocal health. When it came to sort of timing, multiple times throughout a four-year training program proved to have the best retention of of vocal health. So um, just presenting something once doesn't seem to be enough, but if you present it in a workshop or some sort of group organized setting multiple times throughout training, that leads to the best perception after graduating, which is also not surprising. (laughs) You know, more is better. And interestingly, uh, sophomore year was the worst year to present vocal health or voice disorder information. Um, It was like, hands down, anyone that only had stuff taught to them sophomore year, they felt the worst about their voice after graduation. Kind of not surprising as as someone who teaches in college, sophomore year tends to be a, a little bit of a hard year for whatever reason for students. So yeah, so, you know, that was what I was aiming for was what sort of tangible information can I tell people in universities as far as how they need to be teaching it. They need to be teaching it in multiple, you know, multiple times throughout a four-year training program. And it's great for things to be reiterated in lessons and in class as they come up, but there needs to be organized workshops that are dedicated to vocal health or dedicated to different vocal health topics. Um, And that needs to happen multiple times throughout the process in order for people to graduate and really get a sense of it. It's also really important to teach voice disorders and vocal injury in addition to just general vocal hygiene. I allowed the the participants in the survey to leave comments and the comments were truly amazing. If I could just like make wallpaper of all the comments and put it (laughs) on the wall, I would because the things that people said were just amazing. But, you know, a lot of the big gists were more, more, more. People wanted more science. They wanted more medicine. They wanted more information that it just felt like people were just not told practical stuff. You know, they wanted to know what injuries were. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted more practical vocal health information. They wanted to know how to navigate, you know, six shows at a theme park in a day. They wanted to know really tangible stuff. And I think there still is a little bit of a mindset when it comes to like vocal injury and talking about these things with, with singers, a little bit of a mindset of like, you, you do not, they don't need to know about these things. Less is more, you know, like keep them. (laughs) It will, it will interrupt their artistry if they know about those things. But I just don't think that is reality these days. And Mm -hmm. I think that was definitely shown in this study because people just said more, more, more. They said, take us to get a scope, to bring in a doctor, give me all the information you can give me because I feel utterly unprepared. <laughs> yeah. I am so happy that you did this survey and this research in, in this topic, especially because I offer workshops yeah. <laughs> in vocal health and in self-treatment or self-manual mm-hmm. treatment. And I will tell you the schools that I have been asked to come into and do my workshops are those that have pedagogy programs Mm -hmm. and recognize the importance of what we're teaching. And the other schools that I have reached out to about my program have gotten back to me saying, we just don't have the funding for this kind of workshop. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, you don't want to put the funding into staying healthy with your voice mm-hmm. or, ha- or self-treatment or in vocal health. Right. That is so interesting to me. So yeah. I hope I hope that going forward, the academic setting can really start recognizing that this is something that people want. And it really does work in that workshop setting. It's really effective. People take a lot of information from a very little time frame. Definitely. You know, we've made changes at PACE where I teach in the musical theater program uh, into how we teach vocal health. I was sort of already experimenting with how to teach these things. But then once, you know, I, I finished this study, I was able to go, okay, we, these are, this is really what we have to do. We have to be doing something every semester. Um, and we have to really be hitting them over the head with it. I'd rather them be rolling their eyes at me because they know it so well than graduating and feeling unprepared 
scared and terrified when they get diagnosed with an injury. You know, there's no reason to, to panic when those injuries happen. And I just think we can prepare people better for them. Yeah. So how can we encourage more academic settings to include current information on vocal health and voice science? You know, I, th- I think there's a couple of different things. Um, I think, first of all, when it, when it comes to voice teachers, right, whether that's a speaking voice or a singing voice teacher, we just, you have to read, you have to read, 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 read. You have to read Journal of Voice, you have to read Journal of Singing, the Vasta Journal, the Voice and Speech Review. Most of those things, if you're working in an academic environment, you're probably going to have access to most of those journals through your institution. And reading current research is just the best way to stay up on stuff. When I first started research, started reading research, <laughs> I was kind of like, I'm sorry, what? You know, because you start to read things and you're like, uh. I mean, I still feel that way. I look at certain papers and I go, oh God, what is this? I'm gonna skip these numbers. Let's go to the discussion. You know, I mean, it happens, you know, because there are just things that are just out of my my ability to sort of comprehend. But truly, if you start reading research by reading the discussion, you know, read the intro and then read the discussion. (laughs) Truly, it's a great place to start because you get the gist of what people are talking about. As you become more comfortable with the language, with the studies, you can start reading more in depth in sort of the methods and the results and whatnot. But read, read, read. Journal of Singing is really approachable. There is sometimes really good science stuff in there, but it's really um, approachable. You know, and I say this because there are a lot of teachers who maybe have been teaching for a while and maybe haven't read something new in 10 or 15 years and sort of operate in what they were taught in grad school or what their experience was when they were a performer. And the reality is that the business is just changing all the time, both Mm -hmm. the business, the industry side, but also voice medicine and voice science. I mean, you know, we're such a new field (laughs) that I feel like we're always on the cutting edge of what the next thing is going to be because we're just such a new field. So read, reading, reading, reading. I think another thing is is collaboration. Collaborate with other voice teachers. Collaborate with speaking voice teachers. Collaborate with singing voice teachers. You know, find the voice and speech teacher in the acting program at your school. Collaborate. It's so easy as a, as a singing voice teacher in particular to just lock yourself in a little room and believe everything you say because no one's contradicting it <laughs> because mm. there's no one else around. But as soon as you start collaborating with people, you start getting other ideas. You start hearing maybe something that you haven't heard before because that other teacher maybe read a paper or read a book about something that you didn't read. You can get information from them. Even when you disagree with people, that helps form your opinions and your views and allows you to really start to think about why you feel that way about something or why you think a certain exercise works or doesn't work. So I think collaboration is just truly, truly key. I also think collaborating with laryngologists and voice therapists is really important. Finding voice therapists and laryngologists in your community, reaching out to them, asking if you can trail them for a day, watch them work, ask them questions, ask them to come into your school and give a workshop, asking them to come in and do those things. Most of the time they do them for free because it's community outreach for them, right? So, you know, if you do, don't have funding to pay someone to come in, most of the time a, a voice doctor or a voice therapist, they're going to come in for, for free for, from their institution. And so, you know, that is the best way to stay up because the doctors and voice therapists are hopefully staying up with things. And so that will allow you to build those relationships but know sort of what the current research is and the current thinking is because it changes constantly, honestly. And then I think joining organizations, going to conferences, right? NATS, the National Association of Teachers of Singing, VASTA, the Voice and Speech Teachers Association, NISTA, New York Singing Teachers Association, you know, MTEA, the Musical Theater Educators Association, and then PAVA, the Pan American Vocology Association. These are all great organizations that have different sort of perspectives and points of view, but by joining them, you will gain access to conferences, sometimes webinars or online classes. You'll meet people in your community that might also be members of the same organization, which can allow you to, again, collaborate. All of these organizations have journals or newsletters of some sort that come out that have good information. So I think read, stay up on everything that you can, find a journal that you want to commit to for a year and read stuff that comes out in that one journal for the year and collaborate. That's my advice. 
Yeah, that's so important. I'm curious in continued research in this topic, how many people actually, as soon as they moved to New York City or whatever area they were in when they started performing professionally, built a team for themselves? Mm -hmm. It's funny. I, I'm actually going to kind of work on two, two sort of follow-up studies from this. One that I'm going to do is I'm going to look specifically at injured singers in school and how do we best treat them? How do we best handle a singer that has an injury that takes them out of being able to participate in their program? How do we get them back on their feet? What are What's the protocol we need for that? But the other Christine in my life, <laughs> of there's, which there's so many, Christine Estes and I have been chatting recently about doing a study. Again, nothing is finalized, but kind of looking at, at what you were just saying is, do our performers really understand how to build a voice team, what to do if they're injured, what are the resources available to them? Do they really understand that? And if they don't, how can we best prepare them to specifically understand that? So hopefully that will take some shape in 2020. <laughs> and we will we will have a, a study to work on there. But we are definitely talking about that topic together and trying to come up with some ways of looking at that so that people know how to have a voice team. Because that, that showed up a little bit in my study was that only about half musical theater graduates knew what to do. And most of people said they didn't understand what a voice therapist did. So there's definitely room for growth in that area. Yeah. Excellent. So speaking of collaboration, yes. you have also collaborated with Aaron Johnson and with Jared Trudeau, as we mentioned earlier on belting. So you did this research on the acoustic comparison of lower and higher belt ranges in professional Broadway actresses. Can you talk to us about your findings in this research? Sure. So this was my, my very first research project with Yay! Jared. <laughs> my little baby, my firstborn, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jared and I, we were working together at the time at CAP 21 in the musical theater program. And we, we got along like gangbusters, you know, we got along both as humans and as teachers pedagogically. And we decided let's collaborate on something. Let's collaborate on a, some sort of study. And so, you know, we decided to, to do this. And so basically what we wanted to know was as people that teach belting, we know how the belt sort of changes and shifts as it goes higher in the range. And nowadays people are being asked to belt up into the rafters and most belt research really only looks at belting up to about a B or C. Occasionally you'll have a D in there, but it's really, you know, they look at that, what we would consider a much more sort of traditional belt range, right? When you look mm -hmm. at more golden age material, those tend to be the money notes. But there haven't been a lot of studies really looking at the higher belt range, sort of like the E flats, the Fs, the Gs. And so we wanted to take a look at that. And so what we decided to do was gather <laughs> famous friends, if you will. Um, we used uh, only women that had played belt roles on Broadway within the last 10 years of the study, mainly because we really wanted, we wanted women that made a living making these noises, as opposed to students that our perception said we're good at it. Mm -hmm. We wanted people that were validated by the industry where these names and these words were born, right? Belting was born on a Broadway stage. It was called belting. And, and we just wanted women that were validated by the industry. So women that had only played belt roles on Broadway within the last 10 years were, were recruited for the study. And essentially what we did was we looked at directly in these women, we looked at them belting a C in a, a piece of more traditional repertoire. And then we had a, a song, a much higher song where we looked at them belting E flat and F. And then we compared the C to the E flat to the F in each of these 10 women. Our hypothesis going in was essentially that we felt that it was going to be different in the higher belt range acoustically than it was in the lower belt range. What we were surprised to find was that the differences were literally all over the place and not <laughs> unified like we thought. You know, we were so cocky as we headed into this going, well, we know that traditionally in acoustic research, a belt has been defined as a boosted second harmonic. So what we're going to see is that in the lower range, we have the boosted second harmonic and we're going to see something different in the higher range. And for some women, we saw that. And for some women, we saw literally the exact opposite. We saw the third harmonic in the lower range and the second harmonic in the higher range. And it was truly all over the place. We had about six different strategies between those three notes overall. So we were sort of proven 
and right. We just didn't really have an answer as to why certain things happened where. It was not as clean cut, cut as we sort of wanted. But the beauty of the paper, which is in Journal of Voice, also published last fall, about last November, so um, a little over a year old as of today, it showed, it gave us some data that shows that belting is really individual and it can be very individual and that it is not as like tied up with a little pretty bow as researchers have posited in the past. It is, it's different. It's different for different people. And, you know, when we look at tenors, we see that they do different things in the same range. When we look at sopranos, they all do different things acoustically. So why belting would be one thing acoustically always kind of perplexed Jared and I, we were like, I don't, this is not, this can't just be one thing. And so our research showed that it showed that there was variability between different humans in different ranges. You know, we even had women that had played the same belt role on Broadway that did polar opposite acoustic strategies. Mm. So we had like three alphabas and they all did something different. Wow. So it was like, okay, well, this is exciting. You know, now we have to research more. <laughs> yeah. And now I just want to say to the listeners that this research wasn't taken of them just singing a C, an E, and an F. They were actually singing a yes. piece and you took that the note out of the piece so they're not just being asked to just okay go belt yes exactly you know? <laughs> we have them sing um you can't get a man with a gun from annie get your gun for our lower belt right and we had them sing you know a nice 16 bar cut and instructed them to sing it as if they were performing the role and then we had them sing defy the end of defying gravity which gave us the e flat and the f that we looked at so we were able to take those from actual samples we did do vocal exercises like a vocalese and arpeggio with everybody. But ultimately, that just proved to be really challenging because it was a lot harder for people to lock into a viable sound on a vocal exercise. It was much easier to do it in repertoire as expected, but we we did both just to cover our bases. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. And so what is phase two of this research? So phase two for us is that we are essentially doing um, similar protocol. We've picked slightly different songs, but the same sort of idea of something that sits more in that lower belt range, right on the like B and C, and something that that goes higher, again, looking at like E flat and F, so that we can compare. So a very similar thing. We're using the same, different singers, but the same type of subject pool. So women that have performed belt roles on Broadway within the last 10 years. And this time we are going Going to look, we're going to do um, MRI so that we can look at laryngeal position. We can look at the soft palate opening and closing. We can look at jaw shape and jaw opening, tongue position. And then we're also going to do high speed endoscopy so that we can look at vocal fold closure. I'm very excited about both parts of this study, but definitely excited about the high speed endoscopy because we want to be able to see what the vocal folds are doing, which will give us a lot more answers about registration, which is very exciting because our the first First phase was great. We we basically laid you know laid it out saying, hey, people do stuff differently. We don't understand how or why <laughs> what those differences are necessarily. So my hope is that by taking a look at MRI and by taking a look at the vocal folds, we're able to understand this a little bit more and maybe come up with some some more answers about what the different acoustic results mean. So yeah, so I I, I was fortunate enough to um, win something called the Van Lawrence grant, I guess is is what it is. is It's um, presented by the Voice Foundation and NATS, the National Association of Teachers of Singing. Um, And it's a research award that is given to voice teachers. So again, this is a very approachable thing to apply for. It is designed to be given to a voice teacher who is active in research and who has a good idea about a research project and and it's a, a nice monetary grant, which is great because we have to pay for the MRI. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I was fortunate to, to get that, which meant we got to start moving forward with this next phase. So hopefully we'll have more answers once we finish it. So we are looking forward to uh-huh. hearing about this phase two research. Yeah, me too. So another collaboration that you are about to work on, you have a lot of collaborations coming up in 2020. I stay busy. (laughs) I know, I know. I love it. So in 2020, you are doing another study with Aaron Johnson. Also, you did the belt study with Jared Trudeau and Aaron Johnson. So working with Aaron Johnson, again, looking at vocal fatigue throughout the eight show week. 
So this study is, as I just mentioned, in its infant stage, but can you tell us a little bit more about what you are hoping for or planning? Yeah. With the you know, uh, I, I've been, been really fortunate enough in, uh, this last year in 2019 to work on two Broadway shows as sort of the resident staff vocal coach, um, which has been truly amazing and wonderful. And I could talk to you for hours about it because it's been truly wonderful and crazy. But really, I've never been so in the trenches of eight shows a week than I have been in this year. You know, I mean, obviously, I, I was a performer for many years. I did eight shows a week. I, you know, work with singers all the time who were on shows. But something about being involved in these shows and being sort of the like go to person for the cast of how to navigate this stuff kind of got my my head turning in the idea of we don't really know what happens to your voice after eight shows. I mean, we kind of guess. And, you know, there's been some studies that have looked at performers through, you know, a performing gig and sort of their perception of different things. But, you know, there's not a ton of research looking at that, particularly looking at currently on Broadway performers doing eight shows a week. And so, yeah, so we're going to we're going to take a look at it. You know, we're hoping to just get a sense of what acoustic measures change, because the assumption is that the voice would get fatigued through eight shows. So, you know, we want to get a sense of what is the performer's perception of their voice as the shows progress and what sort of measures might change. Where can we see where do the measures line up with the performer's perception? How do we see fatigue setting in based on these measures? So, again, we haven't started it yet. We're going to very soon. But um, yeah, we're, we're excited about kind of digging into this, this particular crowd of singer and performer to get a sense of, you know, how we can better prepare people for eight shows a week, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm always all about learning stuff that we can take into the studio, because I'm a teacher, I sit behind a piano all day, you know, I don't sit at a lab, I don't sit behind a computer typing things up, I, I sit at a piano. And so I'm always trying to research things so that we can find information that we can t tell the voice teacher, hey, this is what we know happens. This is how you can better prepare people. Because that ultimately is my goal, is I want everyone to be as prepared as they can be to keep them you know, happy and healthy and performing at their peak. Right. These people are not robots that do eight shows a week. They're human beings and they have lives and experiences that impact them as people and they still have to go on stage and entertain you. And so, you know, we have to find ways to prepare them, whether that is in understanding what eight shows a week actually does to the voice so that we can maybe tweak how we teach people, understanding how to teach vocal health when people are in college and how to teach about vocal injury so that people are more prepared, so that we understand belting better, so that we can, you know, teach people the most effective efficient way, uh, way to belt. Um, you know, all these things that I do are simply so that my fellow teachers and I can be better so we can do a better job at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in all of this research that you have done, what are three of the most exciting things that you've learned? You know, that's a great question. I would say that one thing would be that changing vocal health is truly attainable. I think that in the vocal health research, you know, it's so easy to focus on the, the fact of like, oh my gosh, look how unprepared people are and they don't learn anything. But the part of the, the study that I like to focus on is we now know that there is a way to teach it that is more effective. It means you need to collaborate. It means you need to teach it frequently. It means you can't just talk about it in voice lessons. We know you need to present it multiple times. I try to stay focused on that. Change is attainable. That's all very doable. You know, that is a really doable thing for pretty much any undergraduate program. You could find someone in your community to come in and do a workshop, or you can lead a workshop. If you're the one reading the study going, wow, we need to change it, you can lead a workshop about vocal health. Um, it's, it's really attainable. That's not super hard to implement into um, a college program. So I find that to be very exciting, that it feels really attainable. It's just about spreading the word that this research exists and that we know that this is a, a more effective way. You know, and I think the next thing is about the belting research, which is that every belter is different. And that is what Jared and I really knew going into it. And any voice teacher or voice therapist that works with belters will know that. They know that that is absolutely true, but it's very exciting to have a little bit of data 
data that backs us up. Mm. (laughs) So yeah, that is something that um, I love. And then I would say generally sort of a third thing is that research is just really doable. What I've learned, because all of a sudden you said I have a very busy 2020 and I don't even think about it like that. But then, yeah, when I like make my to-do list, I realize I have like five running projects and one looming paper that Jared and I are trying to write about perception. And and I realized, oh my gosh, I do a lot of this, even though I would never consider myself a voice researcher in any regard, you know, (laughs) but I I realized like it's doable. Anyone can do it. You have to have an idea and you have to surround yourself with people that know how to implement the idea. You know, when Jared and I started the belt study, we had no idea what we were doing. We just got people in a room and tried to control the conditions and recorded stuff. We luckily got, you know, connected with Aaron Johnson who was really excited about what we did. And he is our, we call him our research dad. He tells us everything, teaches us all sorts of stuff about research and how to do it. And so it's just doable. If you are a voice teacher out there listening and you have an idea or you have a question, look for research, see if that question has been answered. And if it hasn't, go out and do it yourself. Find somebody to help you. I promise it is is absolutely much more doable than I ever thought it would be. Hey, so inspiring. I am actually in the beginning infant stages of also working on some research with Aaron Johnson. Yes. So I very excited. It. He's the best. He's everybody's research dad. <laughs> the research dad of New York City. Exactly. <laughs> so in addition to all of this research, Amanda, you also, as we have briefly mentioned, yeah. you work with several injured singers in your private studio, as well as work as a vocal coach on Broadway shows. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to us about working in these settings? Yeah, it's very funny because those are sort of the two things that I really had my heart set on when I started teaching, you know, based on my experiences of working in a Broadway show, feeling like I had a a voice problem and kind of being lost. I became really passionate about helping people that were lost vocally or had an injury, as well as helping people in shows. You know, I've kind of been a really big advocate for providing more voice resources in long running shows. It's something that I'm really, really trying to push the industry (laughs) towards. You know, we see voice coaches showing up for kids, for sure. I know you had Chris York on, who's fantastic, and one of my Um, dear colleagues at Pace and both just in in the community. Um, He's just a wonderful, wonderful teacher and collaborator. You know, we see vocal coaches showing up for kids or sometimes we'll see a vocal coach in a show for the lead or uh, an Evan Hansen or in School of Rock or the Dewey. You know, we see we see a coach coming in to work with people that, you know, are in leading roles. Something I've been really passionate about is that everybody deserves a voice resource of some sort. You know, we give Mm -hmm. people we give these performers physical therapy every week because we know that if we take care of their bodies, they don't get injured. And the fact that that correlation has not been drawn to the voice yet is so interesting to me. (laughs) I'm kind of frustrating, but kind of just makes me scratch my head. You know, as someone who dealt with a really minor issue vocally, Um, in a show that was compounded and huge to me because it was stalling my ability to do my job. Um, So it's something I've been really, really passionate about. And so this year has been really wonderful because I have had the opportunity to work on two Broadway shows. I worked on Be More Chill at the beginning of 2019, and I'm currently working on The Lightning Thief. So I've been really fortunate to work on these two shows. And what's been great is I have been a resource for the entire cast. I've not just been there for the stars and the leads, but for everybody. So everybody has had access to me me every week so that they can work on their voice. So there has been a lot of working on the show vocally with the actors coming in and going, okay, let's look at your show. Let's sing through stuff. Let's work on these, this yelling and the screaming you do in these character voices. And, and how can we make this the most efficient in your voice so that it feels the most sustainable? And been a lot of me being a vocal health and sort of general health resource for the actors, right? So that they have somebody to call or text when they say, oh my gosh, I woke up today and I have this post-nasal drip. I'm not sure if this means I'm sick or if this means I'm having allergies or what do you think this means? Can you help me? (laughs) And Mm -hmm. kind of being someone who can be a little bit of a, of, you know, an on staff navigator to help try to keep people in their show or know when they need to call out, helping connect the performers to the best laryngologists in the city um, and voice therapists and connecting them with you and connecting Mm -hmm. them with other people that they might need and resources and, and, and helping them get in the hands of 
people because I'm only as good as the people around me. And I've been fortunate to be surrounded by the best of the best. And so I help sort of facilitate that. If there's a vocal injury, you know, helping facilitate that, taking care of the actor, making sure they're in the right hands, communicating with the creative team and the production team, communicating between the doctors, kind of being this sort of liaison. Um, And this go between as I kind of help triage the injury and get the person taken care of, which unfortunately I did have to do this year, but it all worked out and it was all great. But yeah, it's a stressful aspect of the job. And then, like you said, I did a little bit of the the hands-on training so that I can, you know, offer a little bit of assistance in regards to helping people feel, you know, stretched and, and feel like they're calm in the nervous system. Yeah. So I do a lot of different things in these shows. It, it's been really fun, very stressful at times, but it's funny because I, this has been a year of me going, oh, right. I've been preparing to do this and now I'm doing it and I'm sort of making mm-hmm. it up as I go because there's not a lot of people doing this and again I don't know of any show that has had someone for the entire cast swings and understudies included as opposed to just just for the the star or the the children um and so my hope is that this is a turning point of this becoming more norm you know I think that the producers that I've worked with have been really happy because they have seen actors feeling more taken care of they've seen more communication Uh, about understanding when an actor is going to be out that's an important actor perhaps that needs to be in the show because we have important people in the audience and there's just so much that goes on about facilitating all of that and making sure the actor is taken care of but also making sure the show is taken care of and the producers have been really happy I think with that and so my hope is that it that it changes that we start to see people offering voice resources more often in a show or being willing to pay for each of the the singer's own voice person, you know, or reimburse them for it. In my private studio, people that book leads and Broadway shows, you know, I say negotiate voice lessons into your contract, ask for it, beg for it, demand it. (laughs) You know, if they're not going to provide you somebody on staff to help you sing this crazy role that they're hiring you to do, the least they can do is pay for you to have a voice lesson once a week. Something that I've just been really passionate about, trying really hard to change the culture so that the voice is not this you know, mysterious thing that's hidden away that needs the right balm and gargle. And it's a mystery. Instead, it's like, let's just get it all out in the open. It's a part of your body. It can get injured. It can be taken care of. We can be preventative. There are things that we can do to help. I'm just so much more of an open book about this stuff. And my hope is that the industry becomes more that way. And it's getting there. But Mm -hmm. I see a lot of these different pockets that I work in and different little things that I do as all really relating to each other. It's demystifying the voice, demystifying injury, demystifying injury prevention, demystifying all of it, get it all out, you know, so that we are talking about it in ways that are really productive and helpful. And most importantly, helpful for the performer who's the one up there having to use their voice. Right. It is so important creating that awareness. If you're listening to this podcast, whether you're a professional voice user, whether you're a teacher or a speech therapist, wherever you are, informing your students that certainly in New York City, we are creating a change. We are in the midst of a change. It's been happening for about five years Mm -hmm. where agents or at least the artists are now asking their agents and now many agents know to ask for voice lessons and to ask for body work for their artists so that they can perform their shows to the best of their ability. So it is changing. It is changing slowly, but let your students know that this is something that they can ask for, that they can ask their agents for. The worst that's going to happen is someone says no. Exactly. You might as well ask. You might as well ask. And I always say ask for one a week because sometimes they come back and go, well, we'll pay for two a month. And then that's like, that's great. (laughs) You know, I mean, I just, I push people on it all the time. Ask, 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 ask for the moon, ask for it all. (laughs) You won't get it all, but you'll get something. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's move on to my signature question. What is some advice that you would like to give to an inspiring young performer? You know, I, my husband and I always give the same advice whenever people ask, and we always say the same thing. And that is be kind and be prepared because those are the only two things you can control in this business. And those are two things that will get you so far in this business. Um, and they're often overlooked. You know, when it, when it comes to being prepared, I always talk about like long-term preparation, meaning you're paying attention in music theory class in college 
so that your sight reading skills are as good as they can be so that when you're handed that 30 page packet of material <laughs> the night before a callback, you can sight read it and you can learn it fast. Right. So, you know, long term preparation. Right. Staying in dance class and voice lessons so that when things were presented to you, you are ready. Right. You spend your life in a state of preparedness. Um, but then also, you know, short term preparation. Did you read the breakdown? <laughs> Do you know what they're actually looking for? Did you learn your sides? You know, are you prepared for the job interview? I mean, I think this goes beyond just being a performer, but anything in this industry. And those two things will just get you further than any amount of talent. Mm. What is your favorite quote? There is one quote that I do quote all the time, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is hydration is a lifestyle, not a day of precaution which comes from what's called the owner's manual for the voice. And that's truly the only quote I ever quote. So that tells you my level of nerdiness. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) What is something new about the voice that you learned this week? You know, um, I love this question. This week has been a week of, and kind of the last couple weeks have been a week, have been kind of a moment of not learning something new directly as in like, oh, I read this thing in a book and didn't know the knowledge before. But I've had some serious moments in the last like two or three weeks of being kind of very much reminded and slapped across the face about how individual everything is and how anything truly can happen. <laughs> and that just when you think you know it, you know something, it is totally flipped on its head. You know, I have this singer that's been struggling with something and I tried something that is the actual opposite of what you're supposed to do and it has never worked better. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to I gotta pay attention to the person in front of me and stop thinking I know what I'm doing and just try stuff. And the last like two weeks have been that sort of happening a lot, <laughs> which has been great. It's been the universe going, you don't know everything. <laughs> Anything can happen. So that is kind of what I think about when I think about what I've really been learning it's been sort of living something that I kind of knew intellectually, but actually living it over the last week or two. What is one item you could never live without? I mean, probably my phone. Isn't that <laughs> terrible? You know, I sort of run my business and my life on my phone, but yeah, it's terrible. I hate that that's my answer. So my second answer would be straws <laughs> for straw foundation. <laughs> yes. There's my nerdy voice answer and my actual honest dark secret answer is my phone. <laughs> What is one thing you still have on your bucket list? Petting an elephant. I really want to go to an elephant sanctuary and play with elephants so bad. (laughs) I went to one in Chiang Mai, Thailand. It changed my life. That's my dream. I just want an elephant as a pet and to be my best friend. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's amazing. You'll go. I know. I can't wait to hear all about it. At some point I'll go. I know. What is the most delightful word you can think of? You know, my favorite word has always been pamplemousse, which is grapefruit in French. (laughs) It's my favorite word. It means grapefruit in French. (laughs) I love it. What's your favorite book? You know, I've always said that Little Women was my favorite book. And I think it's because it's the first book that I read that made me cry and like made me really feel something from a book. And so it's always just had this place in my heart of like the best book ever. That's it. That's it. Little women. Yeah. What are you currently learning? You know, every year I set a voice focus for the year. I say, okay, this year I'm going to focus my learning on this topic or this idea so that I have a sense of learning something new and a little bit of focus to my learning. So this, this last year was all about the body for me. It was all about focusing on understanding how to be more effective, how to implement changes in a singer's body and in their body connection while they're singing, and how to be better when I put my hands on a, on a singer, how to really fine tune my ability to feel like if I have a hand on a rib cage and I'm feeling them breathe, what am I really feeling? And so that has kind of been my focus this year. What do you wish you would have learned sooner? Well, I guess there's kind of two things. This is one is, is that absolutes are not super helpful. They make us feel really smart to go, well, you can never achieve blah, 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 if you cannot also do blah, blah, blah. But I have just learned <laughs> that every time I say that, there's going to be somebody who comes along and proves me a million percent wrong. And so even though that one person that is proving that absolute that I love to preach, uh, even though they are the opposite, that doesn't mean that becomes my new teaching paradigm. If I know that something is 
you know, more efficient another way. But again, I have to be present with the human in front of me. And that if I start living my life in total black and white absolutes, you will not achieve this function if you cannot do this other function. I'm probably going to miss a lot of stuff along the way. Guidelines, I think, are helpful to know that certain functions lead to other functions and certain things will lead to other things. But again, absolutes are only gonna make me miss stuff. And that's something I majorly learned this last year um, was that, wow, absolutes are just not really gonna help me help me when I'm working on a show and I'm working with a human in front of me who needs immediate help. I have to look at them and I have to help them get better right now. And I can't be looking at what they can't do. I have to focus on what they can do and how to make that better. Um, So that was one thing. And then I would say the other thing that I wish I had learned sooner was um, to trust other voice teachers. And that is a very sort of humbling thing to say, but you know, we, we sit in these rooms with, with us, with my, myself, I sit, in this room that I'm in right now by myself and someone comes in who is seeking my advice and my expertise and I say things to them and they listen to me and I am the, you know, I am the expert in the room. So what I said must have been right. And I do this all day. And this is what we do as voice teachers. And so we start to believe everything we say um, <laughs> because there's <laughs> nobody contradicting it because there's no one else in the room offering another solution. And so we start to believe that our approach and our way of um, operating is the way and the truth and the light. And so when someone comes to us and says, well, I worked with this other teacher and it wasn't really working for me, you know, there's this thing in your mind that goes, well, I have the solution for you and it is my approach. And, you know, I think that that type of mentality is really harmful. We all fall victim to it, particularly, I think, early in your career when you start to find some success and people come to you looking for that success that they heard you can offer. And when they come and say, well, this other teacher, you know, they said these things and it didn't work for me. And you start patting yourself on the back because what you said worked for this person. And and I think that I have just found my headspace to be much better when I give other voice teachers the benefit of the doubt all the time. When someone comes in and says, you know, I tried this, you know, this other teacher tried these things and it wasn't really working, that I can kind of look at it and go, hmm, what was that teacher seeing? What were they seeing? Am I seeing the same thing? How can I explain this in a way that might be more effective for the singer? Because it's more about the singer than it is about proving that that other teacher was wrong or that that other teacher did it the wrong way. You know, I just think that when we stay focused on the singer and helping the singer, we're all better than if we try to sort of tear each other down by trying to, you know, solve all the bad things that the other teachers do. Amanda, if the listeners want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, um, I have a website, which is Amanda Flynn Voice. So you can go to the website. You can also follow me on social media. I'm Amanda Flynnie, which is F-L-Y-N-N-I-E um, on Instagram or Twitter. You can follow me there. Particularly on Instagram, do post voice stuff sometimes. So that can be a fun way to kind of follow along there. But you can always find me on social media or you can go to my website where you can get in contact with me there. And I hope you do. <laughs> Yay. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about research and collaboration. It's been really, really wonderful having you here and talking with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with those you know. You can also subscribe, rate, and write a review. If you want to connect with me, you can now find me on Instagram under The Visceral Voice. You can find me on Facebook under my name or under Life Light Massage, or you can check out my website at lifelightmassage.com. Please join me in two weeks for another wonderful conversation on The Visceral Voice. Mm -hmm.